Huh. Watching Kyle's unboxing videos again? Yeah, he always finds the coolest... No way! A robot dog? Gotta ask where he got it. Or use your Samsung Galaxy S24 Ultra. Just draw a circle around the dog on your screen, and it shows you where to buy it right in the app. Oh, I just learned a new trick. And that for once, I beat Kyle to the next big thing. Circle it, find it. With the new Galaxy S24 Ultra and circle the search with Google. Get yours now at Samsung.com. Internet connection required. Results may vary based on visuals. Hey, what's up? This is Sully from Godsmack. Strap on those boots, baby, because you are now in the trenches of the war room with the one and only Mistress Carrie right here on the Mistress Carrie podcast. What's up? This is Joe Rogan, and you're listening to Mistress Carrie. I have so lovely pretty eyes. Hey, this is Brent from Shinedown, and you're listening to Mistress Carrie. Hey, Carrie, go put your brow on, girl. Hey, this is Steven Tyler, and you'll be listening to the baddest bitch in Boston, Mistress Carrie. What's up? This is Aaron from Stan. And you're listening to Mistress Carrie. Hi, everybody. This is Dave Grohl from the Foo Fighters, and you're listening to the one, the only, Mistress Carrie. Hey, this is David from the band Disturbed, and you're listening to the baddest bitch in Boston, Mistress Carrie. Hi, Bruce Dickinson here from Iron Maiden. Yes, indeed. Miss Whiplash herself, Mrs. Carrie, is here to um, unchain your brain. Hi, this is Flea from the Red Hot Chili Peppers, and you're listening to Mistress Carrie. This is Dennis Leary. You are listening to my favorite, Mistress Carrie. Hey, this is Corey from Stone Sour, and you're listening to. You have the privilege of listening to Mr. Scary. Oh, God. Oh, yeah. Hey, it's Mistress Carrie reporting for duty from MCHQ for episode 191 of the Mistress Carrie podcast. And before we get to this week's guest, Brian Head Welch from Corn, I want to remind you about everything you can find online at mistresscarrie.com. Not only can you find every episode of the Mistress Carrie podcast and every situation report, but you'll also find every episode of my video show, Cocktails in the War Room, get details on my radio shows, check out my events calendar, which has got all of the concerts coming through New England. You can get the links to all of my socials, send me a message right here in the studio, and you can do some shopping in the online Mistress Carrie store. Find all that and more at mistresscarry.com. Brian Welch, otherwise known as Head, is one of the founding members and guitarists in Korn. He's also an accomplished solo artist who has had two stints with Korn and won two Grammys with the band. He's also a vocal sober living advocate. Brian checked in on the show to talk about his journey into sobriety and investing in a new place called Atlantic Behavioral Health in Wilmington, Massachusetts. We also talked about his unlikely ties to Massachusetts, the longevity of corn, learning how to play guitar, meeting Jonathan Davis and how that changed the trajectory of the band, how new metal is classic rock now, the band's partnership with Adidas, his recollections of Woodstock 99, and what the future holds for corn. And that's just the start. Head and I have known each other for 25 plus years, and I am so excited that he's finally on the show. So allow me to introduce you to Brian Welch, otherwise known as Head from Corn. Do I call you Head? Do I call you Brian? Do I call you Mr. Welch? What do you prefer, sir? Oh, Brian is fine. <laughs> After all these years, can I just call you Brian? Yeah, it's just like, all right. The egos are gone. Nickname, schmickname. <laughs> Brian's fine. Brian's fine. It's nice to see you. And I am happy to be able to christen you now an official mass hole. Yeah. I am honored. You are now an official mass hole. Congratulations. Thank you. My life is complete. <laughs> I mean, look, from way back to the beginning of Corn and your relationship with my old station, WAF, you guys were kind of adopted into Boston a long time ago anyway. But now that you are working with Atlantic Behavioral Health, you're kind of now a, an official Massachusetts guy now. Welcome to the yeah. East Coast, Brian. Thank you so much. Um, uh, I'm going to butcher these names, but so I'm a I'm a forgetful person sometimes. And 
Um, I came to visit. I was talking uh, to the guys about Atlantic and, uh, you know, we're just brainstorming for like a year. And then I come to stay at one of their houses during, you know, when we're having meetings and the next week I'm talking to my daughter and my mom on the phone. I'm like, Oh, by the way, yeah, I went up to the Boston area and stayed up by, uh, what's that? Um, Manchester by the sea. Oh, nice. You got nice friends. If you're living up there. I go, I go, I stayed at this cool place and my mom's like, what? She goes, I was born there. And I didn't even, I forgot. I I mean, I knew that she lived in the Massachusetts area, but for some reason it's, it just skipped my mind that she was born outside of Boston. And so, yeah, I w- I stayed literally 10 minutes to, I looked it up on the map where at the hospital she was born. So wait, so, you were an honorary mass hole from the jump. You just didn't know yes. it. Yes. I mean, I can't, I never lived here, but yeah, my mom is probably 10, 8, 10 years old. You know, she moved to LA. So, but yeah, we got history back here. So it's just kind of cool. She was really excited. She was just like, that is the coolest thing. Like, it just seems full circle for her, you know? Well, once we get our hooks into you, even if you leave as a kid, there are certain traits that that people from the Northeast, especially from Massachusetts, they have for life, you know? so Like what? um, Like being an aggressive driver, like being blunt and to the point and sometimes inappropriate, even though, you know, because... Or that people... People from the West Coast a lot of time think that we are aggressive and kind of assholes, but we're just blunt. Okay. I've heard I've heard it described this way. There's a difference between being nice and kind. People on the West Coast, if you get a flat tire, will pull over and go, oh, I'm really sorry that you got a flat tire. I really feel bad for you. And then they'll leave. Whereas people in Massachusetts are kind where they'll pull over, belittle you for tying up traffic and having a flat tire, push you out of the way and change the tire for you. (laughs) Oh, I love it. I could use a little bit of that. (laughs) Come on. It's probably why you've got so many fans in this part of the country, because since Corn debuted, we have just been with you on this ride the whole time. You know what? It's been such an important city for us ever since the beginning. And I remember when we first started touring, I will never forget this, 1995. We were on the road, I think, was sick of it all. And uh, yeah, whoever else was on that tour with us. And we got we went walking because when you're first, when you're young and you're touring around the country of the world, you just want to go walk and see everything, you know? It, everything's brand new. It's the first time for everything. And the first time we came, came into the area, we got not pulled over because we were walking, but we got stopped by uh, officers, and they just made a, made us put our hands on the car and everything. And, and then it, he had, a, like, a really strong accent. So uh, how do they say car here back in the, the couple decades ago? Was it car? A car. We still say that. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Car. But we were like, we we giggled a little bit because we had never, or, or maybe on TV we heard it, but not in person. And we were drunk. And so he said, put your hands on the cat. And we were like. <laughs> and uh, it was just, that was our entrance into Boston. And then ever since then, Tour after tour, which is a wild tour, just shows and crazy crowds, and it kept growing. And it has been, I'm just so grateful for the area. So to to have the mental health place Atlantic that I just partnered in and to be able to come here a lot more is really special to me. It's so funny when I go back and look at all of the pictures that you and I have had together when you've come through town, come up on my radio show, I can tell how old the pictures are based on the length of your hair. Oh, crud. I want to see those pictures. Oh, I'll send them to you. I got some where your hair is really short. That's how old they are. Yes, I want to see them, please. Back on the, uh, 
Was it the Rock is Dead tour that you guys, was it with Zombie back in like 99 or something? Like I've got yeah. crazy old, old pictures of us. It's hilarious. Oh my gosh, please send them. Like to the point where I have some of them that are actually like actual photos that were developed because we didn't have digital cameras or smartphones back then. That's how old these no are. Way. Yeah, I got to scan them, and digitize them. I kind of, I kind of miss those days, honestly. Yeah. Well, it, it all leans into the stuff that you and I are going to talk about, about mental health and all of that, because the world has gotten a lot smaller and it's a lot easier for people to get connected, but technology has also made people a lot more isolated. And thankfully in 2024, a lot more people like yourself are talking about mental health openly and talking about their own struggles, which I think 20, 30 years ago, people just were not willing to do. And it's so helpful. Yeah. And especially um, guys, you know, I, I just feel like guys have a hard time communicating and, and it's just, it, we got to, so the conversation got started a lot deeper and a lot more, you know, and, um, just spread out across the world, but we need to continue it nonstop, you know, because it's really, it's really important. And before, yeah, it was before it was just like, man up, you know, do your thing. It's not that bad, especially in our industry. It's like, Oh, you poor baby, you know, you, you got to go home to your mansion and, 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 and your BMW or whatever. <laughs> and it's just like, but, it's not it. It's like, we've seen it. We've lost too many people that are successful. And now we know that it is a serious issue that money or fame cannot fix. It has to, it has to be talked about. So I'm glad where that the stigmas, um, you know, gone or getting a lot better by the way. And, uh, and I, ju I just feel like it's just, um, it's going to get better and better and better over time. And yes, there's a lot of things that social media has, has helped, you know, like you said, the world's a lot smaller now, but it, it it's also causing some more issues, especially for young, younger kids and everything. And so I'm very stoked to be, first of all, through it, most of it, but, but second of all, to know how to deal with it when it comes back and, to just share, you know, to share my struggles and my successes. And yeah, it's really been cool. I mean, you talk about people we've lost. You, you look at artists like Chris Cornell or Chester Bennington and the lyrics of their songs. There's so much when you go back and read them after we lose them, that, that it was in the music that is part of the reason why so many people gravitate towards the songs. Jonathan Davis obviously has, you know, talked a lot about the uh, emotions that you guys put into your music. So while guys may have a hard time talking about it, you guys are really good at putting this stuff into the songs. Yeah, I think it's, Jonathan's said this many times, it's therapeutic. It's therapy for him to be able to get all this dark out into the light, you know, bring it to the surface, talk about it. And there's so many fans that have come up to us and said, said, you know, you guys have helped my depression so much. You guys have saved me from taking my life out, you know, and just you, I felt like I wasn't alone. And it's not just obviously, you know, you got your Lincoln parks, you got your, your corns, you got your all kinds of bands out there that are, that are helping people. And I just, you know, our singer has processed his pain through his art a lot, you know, and and we're just thankful to have him. I told him yesterday on text, Jonathan, because he he found the restaurant that me and James Monkey found him singing in where we then asked him to join our band. So he sends us a picture and says, look where I'm at. This is, you know, John Bryant's, but it's, you know, it's a new place now, but I was like, I texted him. I said, dude, that was the, that was the most special night because we, we helped you get out of a situation that was ugly for you. 
because you know his, his his other band and and we found the front man of our dreams, you know, and so it was a cool it was a cool moment, you know. You guys have been through so much and have been so willing to talk publicly about your own struggles with band member changes and Jonathan's struggles, you leaving the band and coming back. Corn has taken its fans on a journey and not just shown the 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 great side of rock and roll and fame, but really opened yourselves up to being transparent about the struggles. Yeah. Yeah. It's been a, it's been a, it's been a journey and look, you got to be real in this generation, you know, these, these people in our generation and, you know, the young generation, the older generation, whatever people want real and you can't be a phony man. Cause, cause people can smell a phony so, so quick like that, you know? So you just have to be real. And, since day one, we encouraged Jonathan like to, to you know, he, he had some lyrics that he sang and we were just, we got chills. We we're like, dude, I can't believe what you're saying. That's like, like, people don't talk about this. And he was, he just got inspired by that, you know? And um, he started flourishing and, and just writing more personal stuff. And then, yeah, I think, I think he trained us well, you know, just to be, just to be real and, and open and, I was more, I would say I was more um, private in the beginning. And, you know, to me, it was just a big party. And I, yes, I battled depression, but I just drank it away and or, or snorted it or whatever. And then when it got to the point where it doesn't work anymore, you know, you can't, you can't medicate it anymore because all of that will turn around on you and become it, it starts out as a friend and then it turns as a betrayer and it starts to betray you. And that's when I, when I found my sobriety, when I found my faith, when I found like my love for myself instead of the self hatred, that's when I started to really be um, just open about everything, you know? And so I came, I was more of a late bloomer. Jonathan really got, he got sober and real with with his mental health and everything around 1998 when we got when we were the biggest. You know, his grandpa died and he was drinking Jack every day and he 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 was having anxiety and like a nervous breakdowns and he thought he was gonna hurt himself. So he got sober pretty quick and he dealt with this stuff. He was like, I don't want to be at this amazing being this amazing career and ruin it you know and so he just had a massive dramatic wake up and but it took us the rest of the guys it took us a while because that was like what was you know half a decade or more until a lot of us probably about a decade longer where other people got sober so he had to be around it you know and uh it's crazy. It took us so long, but I'm glad it finally happened, you know, because who knows what could have happened. And more recently, Fieldy has kind of talked about old demons coming back and he, you know, kind of taking a break from the band. It's it's something that is a constant struggle. Yeah, it is. And you're just going to be on guard because, man, you know, it's funny. I used to, when I first got sober, I would kind of... I don't know. I felt overly confident that I was, I'm like, I'm done. I was never going to drink again. That's never for me. I didn't, I got, it was like an enemy that I, I wasn't going to let in again. And I would laugh at alcohol when I walked past it, you know, used to own me or laugh at. And, uh, and then the next thing you know, around the time Chester passed after Chris, I fell off and started drinking again. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, it, they went like two months, you know, could have went longer, thank God, but I got out of it. But, but you just never know, man, you got to have your guard up. You got to be, you got to be ready and, and have a plan in action, you know, in case it happens. So, yeah. Corey Taylor just this week released a statement talking about his mental health and a near relapse himself and, and asking fans to be patient with him while he's trying to manage his own mental health struggles. And I just, I think it's so inspirational for you guys with such a platform that you have 
to be so willing to show everybody that it is a daily struggle. Because I think there's so many people, like you alluded to earlier, that would think, oh, the rock stars, the mansions, the BMWs, you guys have these perfect lives and nothing could ever go wrong. What do you have to be sad about? And by you guys being so willing to talk about the daily struggle of it, I think it's inspirational and it saves lives. There must have been somebody that was like that that inspired you. Yeah. And you know what? And if they see that, you know, we're, you know, our fans see that we're walking through it and we're fighting for it and it'll give them the strength to, to just fight for themselves as well, you know? And I didn't see that about Corey. I'm going to look that up. That's, I'm glad that he's being so open about that too. He's, he's, he's a very special person, man. He's, he's one of the, you know, no one's perfect, but he's just, he's one of the kindest guys that are on that level, you know, and that are just, he's so personable and, and uh, people really look up to him. It's like everything. It's like, there's a, there's a soundbite every week from Corey Taylor on the rock nights, you know, and it's a, so people really follow what he has to say. And that is very cool that he's open about it. Yeah, he posted a, a big video about it on Instagram just yesterday. Oh, okay. So it's that new. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Wow. So I want to talk to you about why Atlantic, why the people that you partnered with, why you put this team together and also the different things that you guys are offering. Because it's all brand new. Yeah, it's all brand new. And I, I got to sit in for three hours today in, in the group. And, and me and my friend Justin, we talked about our um, our tools, our, our strategies, our journey, our story. Um, and most most people, not yeah, I'd say almost all people that, that I've talked to have some kind of maybe background in um, addiction. Um, and so it, it, it goes hand in hand usually, unfortunately, but, but uh, it's a very new program. But um, my friend, Justin, I'm at his house right now, by the way, cause we just left at Atlantic and, and uh, I met him around 2011 when I started playing in my solo solo band and everything and i think there was a a festival up in this area and he came to see me so i was living in nashville at the time and his i met his sister and we became friends with her family and she told me about her brother that was a rock fan and that's all i knew and so hung out with him 2011 ish and then started um finding out that he's you know getting fallen into addiction a lot and over the years it got worse and worse and next thing you know he's like just heroin you know speed balls everything and he's stealing from family he's st robbing just crazy in and out of jail probably like you know seven or eight years total in and out of jail you know and um it just i I've seen addiction in my life and the corn guys and, but to, to get to a point where you're like getting locked up for years and just, you know, going back and forth to jail, I've never seen it as far as like in a personal way that bad. I feel like jail is like a wake up call and to see him just not, you know, go deeper and deeper and just get, I mean, he would, he would lie to his his mom from prison and just try to get her to send money. And then, you know, and then she would send money and he'd just be lying about stuff. And he was just, you know, drugs in prison and stuff. So it was pretty crazy. But I saw him a few years ago and I looked in his face and something was, was different. And he had gotten into the, uh, to the treatment industry and just found purpose and it, he, it was a spark that, cause he would always try to get sober and he would stay sober for weeks or months, a few, a few weeks or a few months, but it just, it never stuck. And something was different in his eyes. And, um, I was like, oh my gosh, I think this kid like finally got there. And so I, I stayed in touch with him and then I started, uh, wanting to get involved in, 
and inspire him and help him out and show him like, you know, I, I got your back, you know, you can do this. And so he had a good team up here. He lives in Manchester, New Hampshire. And so we started hanging out and, and I helped him get some sober living homes. And so started doing that together. I started coming up here a lot and talking to the guys in the homes and just hanging out and just, you know, I just love to show people like you can do it, man. Cause if I can do it in the crazy rock world, then you can do it. And so we just, we met some other people in, in Boston and in, in the same industry and just had a, there's a place called Mayflower in the Boston area. That's a treatment facility and just got to be friends with got those guys through Justin amazing guys one of them is an ex la entertainment attorney worked at warner brothers in-house attorney for warner brothers i think amazing guy amazing he's and some of his brothers are involved and we just started talking about it and and um there was just a need you know there was a need for it and i became uh, a small investor in it and I only do things that my heart are fully wrapped in, you know, nowadays. So it just, I don't want to waste my time. Life is too short and, you know, I'm, I'm all about helping people. So it just, it sounded incredible. And then once, once I saw the connection with my mom, you know, and, and all that, I just feel like it was, I've, I've been led, I've been led here to do this, you know? And so we'll see, it just opened. We'll see how it goes. And, it's very cool because um, we talked about how it's really brand new, you know, but the aspect, there's all these different aspects of the, of the program. It's like there's group therapy for nine to 12 and with, you know, two breaks or whatever, a lunch, and then they come back and they'll do one-on-ones therapy for the afternoon and for those who can't do the daytime, there's another group and one-on-one at night. So people can work during the day and come and do it. And usually it's one to two months of treatment, you know, and there is, uh, if you need medication, you know, mild medication or whatever to help you. And I just want to say right now, I've been on medication for over 15 years and, it is non-narcotic and it's helped my my levels you know keep me keep me good and just recently i've been able to wean off um a lot of milligrams so i'm i'm eventually going to just i'm getting older you know my and it's affecting some of some of my physical stuff but it's it is a godsend i think some of that some of those treatments of medications and so yeah, we got that aspect of it and group therapy and one-on-one therapy and it's just really cool. I sat there and I and I just was like a fly on the wall today. It's talking to people, the clients and and sitting in and I was I wish I had something like this when I was just, you know, those few times trying to get sober and going to uh, a psychiatrist early on. It just I said it in in one of the videos I released about Atlantic that You know, sometimes you talk to some of the doctors back in the day, especially, I think it's a lot better now, but they're just so smart, you know, and they're, I just didn't connect on a, on a real level with them. And so to see, to see how Atlantic is set up, I really felt like you can relate like all these people. There's, there's, there's moms there with teenagers. There's a 19 year old kid that's been hiding an addiction for eight years. There's, you know, married people. There's a guy that owns a business. There's, it's like all over the spectrum and they're all talking about similar issues and how, and finding tools to get, to get past it. And really amazing. I, I, I hadn't had nothing like that when I was going through my stuff. So the idea of you being a fly on the wall, you don't exactly blend Brian. All right. Well, (laughs) so, so I'm in there and and uh, we were talking, they're asking us questions for a while. So I had to really say, okay, it was good to talk to you guys. 
but I want to see what you guys do. And I just want to, you know, so after the break, we came back in for an hour and a half and I just watched them and uh, it was, it was really cool. And I was a fly on the wall then because I didn't say anything for like an hour and a half. It was really cool. The amount of time that you have spent in the music industry is an enigma in a lot of ways. The fact that Corn, I, I bet when you guys started, you never could have imagined all this many years later that you would still be at the top of your game. And that's that's got to be something, you know, I, I ask people all the time, is it harder to get in? Is it harder to get the record deal? Is it harder to break in? Or is it harder to stay there? Right. Man, I mean, I think the I think the answer is the easy answer is it's harder to stay there because we got in relatively quickly. And so it was kind of easy for us to to get in, um, you know, but we we worked. I started playing guitar at 10 years old. I met the guys and became friends with all the guys by by 10th grade. Um, Jonathan was not in in the picture in a close way. We just knew of him in a, in a distance, you know, at a distance. And when he came to try out for us and sing with us, I was like, you look familiar. And I found out I've been going to school with him since he was in third grade and I was in fourth. And he was the kid who had the music store. His family owned Rick Davis music and he's Jonathan Davis. And I'm like, dude, I know of your family store my whole childhood. And so it was, it's, it's just crazy to, to finally go up to LA and get our record deal. And, you know, but once we got him in the band and seeing how, just like I said before, he was just our, a dream front man to find, you know, and, and to have him in. And once we started playing around Hollywood, we started, it was just, he, he had that, that it, that it factor. And we had that, that sound of the guitars that no one was having. And so it stood out. We didn't know if we were going to be signed to a bigger label or a smaller label or what, but we knew we were going to be signed. And so that was kind of easier to get up just to, to, I guess, I guess the, the sound and everything came, came natural to us. It's not like we were, it just kind of, you know, we were fans of all kinds of different genres from, hip hop to Nine Inch Nails to Morbid Angel to Pantera to Cypress Hill to Duran Duran to like, it was a mixture of all this stuff, the cure. And, uh, and so, yeah, we got signed, started playing. And I think the longevity aspect, now we all know that corn has had an up and down t type of journey. You know, there, there were times that, that some of the places became smaller, you know, that, that we played. So there were, there are dips. It's like, I guess the stock market is like going <laughs> up and then you dip way back down. There's a crash. And, but uh, they've always been able to, to make a living and, and to get to the fans and the fans have, have always been supportive. So it's been a blessing. I think there's been a, a, a wave of, because new metal was kind of getting bashed around in the media for about 10 years ago and stuff. And I'm, I'm like, you know, I don't know what's so bad about it, but uh, now it's starting to get the uptick again. And, and you guys and are so classic been, rock now, which is just so weird for me to even say out loud. It's so weird. I remember when Motley Crue became classic rock and I'm like, what? <laughs> I'm getting old. Oh, no. And then now we've made it into that. And it's just it is crazy. You just just never know. But I am so grateful to be able to play this. I never thought I thought like people retire in mid 40s, you know, <laughs> and here we are going to mid 50s, you know, and then to see bands like Metallica bigger than ever the stones are touring football stadiums this summer it's insane I know. and it's like it gives you hope you know and to to have a really long career i never would have thought metallica are so cool and they're 60 you know and it's it's just it's really cool to see the longevity part i think is just 
I think um, I, I believe in destiny. I think it's meant to be. And there's a lot of other bands that are that are living that blessing as well, too. A lot of our friends are still going. You got the Incubuses, the Deftones, the you know, system of a down, you know, chugging along there. But uh, it's it's cool to see friends of ours still going, too, you know. Who gave you that first guitar when you were 10? Where did it come from? Um, there was this department store in, in California called Best. And they sold these junky little electric guitars. And it, it was like a, remember Angus Young's Gibson? It was um, the red one he was always playing. It looked kind of like that. It was like a copy of that. And I got this amp. It was like this big and a distortion pedal. And my, I remember I got a acoustic guitar and my parents said, if you learn something we can recognize, we can maybe talk to you next summer about electric guitar. But they're like, show yourself dedicated before anything and so I, I learned mary had a little lamb i learned all these stupid little songs and next thing you know i had my <laughs> i'm trying to imagine head from corn playing mary had a little lamb on an acoustic guitar <laughs> <laughs> well i could show you some some childhood photos i was definitely not a head from corn i was a, a nerdy little kid that found like a superpower in playing guitar because I, I got, I got bullied. I got picked on. I was funny looking and the girls didn't like me. And so I was one of those kids that finally, when I started learning guitar, even like the bullies found out and they would ask me to play songs. And my brother who picked on me, I would play songs for him. And it was, it was really cool. It was like a superpower. Please tell me you still have that little guitar from Best. Do you still have it? I don't have the guitar. Oh, come on. Right? And Monkey has his first guitar. No, no, no. I, so I sold, I got a PV Mystic after the red guitar. I got this guitar called PV Mystic. It was white. It was shaped like Lita Ford's guitar. And um, I sold it to Monkey when he was 14 years old to get the guitar I wanted. So after he started learning the electric, because he only played acoustic at that time, he ended up getting a Charvel, which was his next dream guitar. So he still has that Charvel. He does. We don't have the Mystic, but that's the closest thing we have to the first guitar is Monk. You talk about the longevity of Corn. You guys did something last year that has taken so many years to pull off. Your partnership with Adidas, the fact that it took this long... I was like, are you kidding me? They wouldn't do it. It wasn't for our lack of interest. I know. It was just a mainstream company, and it still is. But everybody was just scared of the marketing, of the of the, the dark lyrical content of Jonathan, of the Adidas, and what it stood for for that song that we, you know. And so they just... They wanted to do safer collabs, safer relationships. And even this one that we're on right now, this thing that we're doing with them, they, um, we weren't talking to them, but there was some people at the company behind the scenes that were talking about it. And it just didn't come to fruition for four or five years. It didn't get to us till like four or five years later. So, I don't know. We're just, we're thankful. And Jonathan, it's like one of his dreams, you know, cause he was the front man. He was the Adidas guy. And, and so we all wore it, but that was his baby. I know? got and tagged really so it. many times when the story came out with people asking me if I was going to get the purple sparkly tracksuit. And I was like, I am going to look like Violet Beauregard and Willy Wonka. If I wear all that purple with the hair, I can't do it. <laughs> I would look ridiculous. Honestly, Jonathan, you sound like Jonathan. <laughs> he, he's like, I, yes, I, I, st I started this. He made the sequence track suits and everything. But when he puts them on, he's like, it was awesome. Then I just am a different guy now. And so <laughs> you sound like our singer. Well, I, 
it's just a little too much purple. When your hair is purple, it's hard to wear everything else purple. Right. Okay. I get it. He's just like, he doesn't want to, yeah, he just, he wants the fans to wear it. So that's why we released it to them. One of the big things that's happening this year, which blows my mind is, um, later this year, the 25th anniversary of Woodstock 99. Now I went to Woodstock 94 and then I was at Woodstock 99 and I was kind of unaware about all of the negative stuff that was happening. And it felt so bad when all the documentaries came out because I had such a good time because I was a little bit removed. What are your memories of that whole thing? Because it's kind of crazy to see fan sides of it versus the band's perspective of everything. Oh my gosh, you're totally correct. I had no idea. Most of us had no idea that the biggest thing that was talked about was the obvious ones. It was like when, when biscuit, when all hell was breaking loose and, and they're ripping things off of the, the, the sound you know, column or whatever, you know, but from my where I was, it was like, like the most punk rock thing I've ever seen. It was like everybody's surfing on boards on top of the crowd. It looked fun. It was just crazy. But um, that was, that's as bad as it got. Just people re- tearing some stuff down, you know. And we left. We flew out after their show. We went to the hotel. Um, I think we flew out like 3 a.m. or something like that. So we were only there for two nights and it was wild, but it was a fun wild. And I had no connection with anybody in the audience. You know, it was all my, my family and, and, and friends or whatever were backstage. And so we had zero idea what was going on in the crowd. So horrible. I can't believe some of the stuff that's happened after watching the documentaries and, and everything. And it's just like, the organizers could have done a lot better and it's just unfortunate, you know, but I'm with you. I, I had no idea. And then when I got home and saw the, the biggest obvious sign, which was the, uh, the, the fire, <laughs> like everything getting lit on fire. And then I you was there for all of that. That's when I knew things had gone awry. I was like, Oh boy, here we go. Yeah, I was gone. So we, we, we got a private jet with ice cube and, and biscuit and, and all of us just, we we rode in, fl- played the show the first night, hung out the next day, and then took off. And next thing you know, I wake up hungover from the crazy weekend, and I see just fire everywhere on the TV. And chili peppers, or you know, all that. And I'm like, why are you giving, after watching the documentary, why are you giving candles out? It's like, you are just asking for trouble so that that private like, jet flight must have been insane it was insane like it was all it was like us white boys trying to play craps with the with the uh rappers and they just took our money for like <laughs> five hours <laughs> it was horrible <laughs> before i let you go i have to ask you the obvious corn questions What's going on with new music? When are you guys going back out on the road again? I'll I'll get uh, I'll I'll never hear the end of it if I don't ask you those questions. Yeah, well, you know, like we are, um, you know, when bands are working on new stuff, it's like got to be kind of secret and all that. But we've been off and on in the studio for like I don't know about about a year. But we would, you know, we would take we're just going for a week and then go off for a couple months, come back and see what we got. Maybe write a few more and just, we're, we're going to, we're piecing them together now and seeing what we got. And, uh, we, we just announced some European dates in July, August. So very excited to go back to Europe. It's been a while and, um, yeah, trying to get some plans for, for this, for this country as well. And uh, there'll be some news coming out probably in the next three months or so. I always ask songwriters this question when they come on the show because I'm 
I'm so envious of the craft of being able to do it because I can't do it myself, but I'm surrounded by you guys so I can climb into your brains to try and figure out how it works. Can you give me an example of a song from, it's not a favorite song question, from any artist, any genre that you think is perfectly crafted from a songwriter's perspective? And then tell me why you think it's so brilliant. Um, okay, but I, I don't want no one to get mad at me for the for the band that I choose. <laughs> you can be I'm going to choose a, a non-metal band. Um, Coldplay Clocks. And I say that just because I'm a, a man of melody, but I'm also a man that loves uniqueness. And there's no other song in that that pop indie type of style or just i'd say any genre really that that sounds like that song and that's just an example of many but and it makes me feel something and to this day i don't know what it's really about but it's just that's the that's the mystique of it it's like artistic melodic it makes you feel something it's very unique and it just takes you on a on a ride, you know. So, um, oh, and poetic. It's very poetic and abstract. So, like you know, all these years later, I don't know what it's really about, but um, but it's but it's very artistic and poetic and abstract, and I love that. Is that where it starts for you with melody, or are you a riff guy first? Where does it come from for you? Um, it could come from either, but um, since I came back in the band. It's been me and James musically have been closer than we ever have. Even the first 10 years, like we, we were all close the first 10 years, you know, and unfortunately, you know, um, Fieldy is been on break for a long time and David's unfortunately been out of the band, but so we all collectively would be in the room and just, you know, be drinking and writing and we had fun and we crafted some cool classics, you know, but um, nowadays, whether they got as big as those or not, it doesn't matter. Me and James musically have been just like so close. And it's been just me and him. Fieldy was always the type that would come in once in a while, but he would uh he would mainly learn the stuff when it's time to record bass. And that was fine. It just it worked that way, you know. But just me and James, it's been really special to to uh come in and sometimes he would come in with a riff and and I would come in with a melodic part or whatever or we would both come in and just feed off each other right away it just kind of depends we just start playing and it sounds like a garage band like some kids just making noise and then someone hears something hey what is that what is that right there and then we'll we'll latch onto it and that will be a foundation. We'll start building from that point on. Well, you are going to be spending more time in the Northeast because of Atlantic Behavioral Health. And now that it's open and you have been dubbed an official mass hole now, now finding out your second generation mass hole. Yes. <laughs> the next time that you're here... Um, I would love to take you out and get you some really good local food. Somebody yeah. that's born and raised here, absolutely. You no, know, especially if you like Italian food. Like, I wanna, I wanna take you out and and show you maybe a little bit of the food that you guys never get to eat because you're always in and out of town so fast. You're right, and you know what? I'll tell you one one thing, Boston. These. I don't know who the promoter's been, but we've had some great food backstage the last few years. Oh my gosh, it's been amazing. There's little hole in the wall places. So uh, I, I've had these crazy kind of retrospective conversations recently with guys like Sully from Godsmack and Brent Smith from Shinedown because, like you, our careers have been together the whole time. Yeah. And Sully and I went out for magic meatballs and raviolis at a little Italian place 25 years ago, which he credits as being good luck. And so I got to take you there too. Little hole in the wall, family owned place. Amazing food. That would be awesome. And we'll, we'll bring some respective friends and just have some freaking meatballs. Yes. 
Let's do it. I'm yeah. in. Yeah. The magic meatballs. Next time you talk to Sully, ask him about the magic meatballs. He'll tell you. Okay. They, they make dreams come true. <laughs> 100% will do. Congratulations. It's amazing that you are helping so many people through your own struggles and being so transparent and so open. It it really is something that you should be proud of because it's not easy to do. And because you're doing that, you're helping so many people. So congratulations. I appreciate it. Then it's really addicting to uh, get out there and do stuff. And so anybody that's listening that may be struggling with uh, mental health or addiction or anything like that, like once you, once you find something that you can do to give back, I swear you come alive, you know, and it, it becomes an addiction, a healthy addiction. And so whether it's one person a month or, you know, doing it constantly with just, uh, you know, hundreds or whatever, it doesn't matter. It's just, once you start doing it, it's just addictive. It's just, it's, it's, it's fun. It's how I get high now. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a lot more productive and positive than the old way. 100. It was so good to see you, Brian. Congratulations. You too. Thank you so much. Appreciate you talking to me about it too. There he is, Brian Welch, otherwise known as Head from Corn. Check the show notes of this episode to find the link to Atlantic Behavioral Health if you or someone you love is struggling with addiction or mental health issues. You'll also find the link to this episode's corresponding playlist. I make a playlist for every full-length episode of the Mistress Carrie podcast that features my guest music and all the other artists and songs that we referenced in the interview. You'll also find all of Brian's links and all the corn links and the Mistress Carrie links. If you liked what you heard, don't forget to like, follow, and subscribe to the Mistress Carrie podcast. New full-length episodes come out every Wednesday. Plus, every weekday, you get the sit rep. All of your rock news, music headlines, and entertainment updates in about five minutes. And you never know when we're going to release a bonus episode. Join me live every Tuesday night at 8.30 Eastern for my video show, Cocktails in the War Room. And of course, you can always find me on the radio. Get the details on all that and more at MistressCarrie.com. The Mistress Carrie Podcast, a proud member of the Pantheon Podcast Network. To celebrate joining Pantheon Podcasts, Rock Camp, the podcast, the official podcast of Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp, is giving away a guitar signed by Mike Portnoy of Dream Theater, Marty Friedman, formerly of Megadeth, and legendary shredder Zach Wilde, plus our rock star counselors like Vinny Apice, Monty Pittman, and more. To enter to win, simply follow, rate, and review our podcast on your preferred platform, and that's all you have to do. For more information, go to rockcamp.com forward slash podcast.